Well, hello there, Dev Central community. It is that time again. It's Thursday, 12:30 Pacific, and it's time for Dev Central Connects. I'm John. This is Jason, and it is great to be with everyone. Jason, how you doing today, my friend? I am doing fantastic. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey man, we are streaming like we do every single time to YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter, and uh, and we're out there on Twitch as well. So, uh, so all you gamers out there, you know, drop us a line. Um, and we would enjoy talking to you as well. So um, we'll interact like we always do. So it's uh, it's going to be a great show today. So uh, so Jason, I know we've uh, we've got some some announcements coming up here pretty pretty soon. But I've got a question to start things off here, if you don't mind. What do you okay. think? Well, you usually do. So and it's always entertaining. <laughs> That's right. All right. So here's here's my question. What is the first job that you ever had? Like where you actually had a paycheck, that kind of thing. I'm not talking about like, hey, you watched your little brother and you got a, you know, a nickel or whatever, but what was your first job? See, you're going to third person like Seinfeld me now. It's like, Jason's <laughs> getting angry. Uh, my <laughs> first job was a paper boy. And, okay. you know, at the time I thought, hey, you know, it's, I, I worked like I had to, they delivered the papers. I had to roll the papers. If it was mm -hmm. raining, I had to put them in the plastic. And I, I delivered paper six days a week. Wednesdays and Sundays were, were heavy days. And uh, it, it took me a good hour and a half to two hours um, on on the the Wednesday and Sunday days, mm -hmm. um, and about forty five minutes to an hour on the other days. And but I also had to go collect the money uh, from yeah. customers. So on top of delivering the papers, I also had to make them pay me. <laughs> and I I didn't get paid if they didn't give me money. And right. so at the end of the month, I'm tallying you know what what I get. I think my best month, I probably made $35. And so uh, I was, I was yeah. taken advantage of like uh, pretty badly, but I was 12. And so, you know, I was happy to have a few dollars in my pocket. Yeah. 12 year old, 35 bucks. That was good. But yeah, I'm nope. inevitably you run into that customer. Oh, Hey, you know what? I, I uh, come back, come back tomorrow and I'll get you. Exactly. You know? Yeah, whatever, it's dude. Like maybe you're going to get a paper through your windows, what you're going to get. <laughs> right. <laughs> or you just won't get a paper next time. You know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this thing out. Awesome, <laughs> man. So mine, speaking of papers, my dad actually had a paper route. And uh, I wish I could call that my first job, but my first paying job. I worked that job. I just didn't get paid for it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, mine was a grocery. I worked at the grocery store. Like I stocked the shelves and then like took the groceries that, that was back in the day, at least small town where I was from. We, we like bagged the groceries for the customers and then walked yeah. it out to the car, put it in the car for them, the whole thing, you know? Oh yeah. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about those things. Like, Hey, what'd you, what'd you do back in the day or whatever? And like newspapers now that job is kind of, I'd say that's, that's not much of a, not much of a job anymore. Like there's not a lot of newspaper yeah. delivery. And then even with the groceries, I've been looking at uh, lately, you know, Hey, how are people shopping now? They shop totally differently. There's the Instacart, right. there's the shop online and just deliver it to my house. And I don't care if there's, I don't even care if the, if the can of beans is on the shelf, I just want you to deliver it when you get to my house. Right. That's or whatever. Right. That's right. And so anyway, so a lot of this, a lot of this where I'm leading has been automated of sorts, if you will, and uh, and that's kind of appropriate for what we're talking about today. So it's uh, it's an interesting world we live in. You know, that's true for sure. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, good to go. Yeah. So it's always fun to kind of, you know, kind of reminisce a little bit, you know, think back to yesteryear and what happened and, you know, where we've been. So good stuff, man. Good stuff. Well, so, hey, I know we've got a couple of announcements uh, coming up. We do. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously we're talking about the uh, state of application strategy today uh, with guests I'll introduce here in a second. Next week, we're back with you having a security sidebar. That's right. Two weeks from today, we're going to have Corey Marshall and Brian McHenry, and we're going to talk about zero trust. And of course, we have uh, Agility coming up April 20th through the 22nd. On my show last week, I introduced this, and then I totally was like, I don't know if the labs are that week, because last year they were separate, but I got some help in, in the chat. It's like, yep, labs are happening. So you know, uh, get, get registered. Uh, registration's open. Registration for the labs will come a little bit later. Uh, but they are part of Agility, and so you, know, you want to make sure you check that out. And then also I wanted to briefly mention the uh, the release that we had yesterday on the vulnerabilities. There are four of those vulnerabilities that are critical, and, and they're serious. So take it seriously. Go out, read the documentation, get your uh, big IPs updated uh, as soon as possible. And so 
With that, we have two amazing guests with us today. Uh, we have uh, Sidi Borvik and Lori McVitty, and uh, let, let's get into this thing. Let's do it. All right, Lori McVitty, Cindy Borvik, how are you today? Great, how are you guys? Good. We're fantastic. Awesome. So for the audience that, that doesn't know you, Lori, you know, who are you and what do you do here? Um, <laughs> All right, I well, maybe I should ask, what don't you do here? <laughs> right, right. That's a, that's, a, that's a shorter list, Jason. It's not a trick question, Lori. It's not a trick question. <laughs> it felt like a trick question. I know right. things and I write. Right. That's, you know, when it, when it comes down to it. Um, I work in the office of the CTO now, and I do a lot of strategy, a lot of insights, a lot of reading the internet yet digging through research, trying to figure out, right, how it all fits together and how it's going to drive it forward, forward, right, to what our, our strategy and our vision is. Okay. And Cindy, uh, why don't you tell us something crazy about yourself, uh, not related to F5, and then, and then tell me, tell me, tell me what, uh, what you do for F5. Oh boy. Oh, this is, <laughs> oh, well, you know what I'm going to tell you? My first job was yeah. that I scooped ice cream. Oh. And I don't think that job is automated yet. So I think, oh. you know, that one would still would still stand the test of time, right? I mean, yeah. we, we don't have robots scooping our ice cream yet. And Massachusetts mm. is the number one state per capita of ice cream consumption. And that's where oh, I am yeah. now. And I can tell you, having worked in an ice cream shop and um, many a, a hot summer evenings, that we served a lot, a lot of ice cream. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, so really quick, I, when I think about Massachusetts, I think, you know, that's Northeast, that's cold, it's really cold in the winter. But I guess, do people just eat ice cream all year long or do they kind of save it up? And then in the summer, they're just like going crazy because they haven't, you know, had it. Oh, we, we eat it all year long, but like the ice cream shops open, you know, we're, we're waiting in line when those seasonal ice cream shops open. So there's okay. one right near me and they open like at the end of April and everyone is like marks it in their calendar and they're ready. To nice. Go. It's a whole event. Yeah. I love it. I actually yeah. don't like, I actually don't like ice cream as much in the summer. Uh, something about just really? being hot doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't sit well. Cause it's like, you just want to drink like a gallon of water <laughs> after you eat your ice cream. I prefer yeah. ice cream more in the winter time. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I love ice cream anytime. I mean, while I'm not doing any exercise in the winter, it's important to eat the most calorie-rich things I could possibly right. eat, right? And oh, um, the other thing I do uh, at F5 is I am the Robin to Lori's Batman. So I, you know, we, she and I, <laughs> we, uh, we, we are uh, work together on our big research piece uh, throughout the year. Um, which is the state of application strategy. And then I'm also on the corporate strategy team. And I also, and I look out and see what's happening in the marketplace and make sure that that is uh, translates into what we're doing from a strategic uh, standpoint. Well, that was a great segue. So, you know, let's talk about the, the state of application strategy. You know, you, you said, you mentioned that this is a, a big research effort. How much time, you know, before we get into the details of the report itself, how much, how much time do you actually, you know, invest in putting this together? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, it's a big effort. Um, it's a joy. It's a, I, I'll say that like the, when the data comes back, Lori and I are always very happy. We call them data days and we're really happy to dig into the, the research, but we, we will start, um, deciding what to do for the survey uh, probably in about a month. And then as you can see, the report just came out. So it it takes at least six months out of the year, maybe um, a little longer. Wow. That, that's a that's a heavy investment. So it is, yeah, you know. it's a lot. I mean, I remember reading and we'll get into the details as we go here, but like you had over 1500 people respond to this latest, you know, version or whatever, which means you sent out a lot more than that. I can only imagine <laughs> the response rate is not a hundred percent. So shockingly, man, that's, uh, that's a that, ton that's of effort. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah that's yeah. automated. That piece. We don't do that <laughs> by hand, so it's it <laughs> automatically. That's right. Watching that's right. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. But we, we, we um, one of the things uh, that we do is we translate the survey into eight languages. Wow. So, um, so we, we really, the reason why we have such a great response rate is folks around the world can answer it in their native language. Um, okay. And so that really, that, that helps um, in uh, encouraging folks to answer surveys because they may be very used to getting surveys in English, but they're not always getting surveys in their native language. Yeah. Do you think that's, I mean, just, you know, tangentially is, do you think that's off-putting to get surveys that are, that are in English only? I would think so. Yeah. I think at least, and then for some of the folks, you know, we give, they have a, maybe it's not their native language, but there's a choice of languages. And so hopefully they would know that, you know, one of the mm -hmm. languages that's on, that's on the survey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let, let's get into the, into the nitty gritty. Um, first off is just anything really jump out at you that was a surprise uh, from last year's data. That, that there's a developer with a really big hat rack out there who's like my soul, like, you know, brother, sister, whatever, right? I, that, that was an actual response about a role. Um, that, that surprised me because I thought I was the only person who really liked, you know, hat racks. But you know, <laughs> if we were looking for a more serious answer, um, I, <laughs> I think the, um, the, the rapid acceleration through the phases of digital transformation were really surprising um, just because it was such a big leap. I mean, you know, you know, anecdotally in, in your daily life that, you know, services started popping up that were digital. Like yeah. last year at this time, I could not get DoorDash to deliver. I didn't even have DoorDash. I couldn't get right. anyone to deliver groceries or fast food to my house. Today, I have like five different options, right? Yeah. I mean, you knew anecdotally this was happening, but to actually see the data bear that out to say, oh, no, they have leapt forward, um, you know, very fast through these phases was was kind of surprising to see it so starkly represented by by the numbers. Hmm. Yeah. Well, when you think about, you know, the, the transition to modern apps from traditional architectures, it, in relation to COVID, right? Nobody's actually going into the office. And, and so if you work in a data center and and you have lots of people working in the data center, things like COVID is problematic for that. Whereas if you uh, can do all of that and spin it up from home, you know, the, the um, attraction of moving to modern architectures, I think maybe it, maybe it was a driver this year. What do you think? Yeah. I would say that um, the that we we there were folks that were probably a little further along in digital transformation, like financial services. Like we looked, we 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 looked at the data a little bit in terms of uh, verticals, and so they were already further along in digital transformation, and then they went, then they 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 leapfrog even more, and then there were folks that were you know in the middle of the road and then they still move forward so like everyone moved forward and they moved forward in terms of the use of automation and then and then they all moved forward in terms of modern architectures and and so it kind of depends on where they what types of architectures they had in the first place and how quickly they could move to those modern architectures yeah that makes sense Lori you were giving me the stink eye so I'm, I'm guessing you had a different opinion. <laughs> Lori always has an opinion. Um, so, I mean, we tend to we tend to think of we hear modernization and we think, oh, that means replacing the old stuff with new stuff. But in reality, what's going on is every time there's a change in the user and the demand for access, you get new interfaces. Um, so, 20 years ago, we were doing three-tiered web apps. That was new. That was exciting. It was cutting edge back in the day, right? That was the form of modernization because that's how we extended access to a new set of users, right? And now, right, what COVID did was accelerate this demand to another 
you know, bigger set of consumers. And so there's a need to modernize even more. And the app architectures have changed and the expectations of those users have changed. So efforts to modernize are taking the form mostly of things like APIs and then modern components. So we'll slap on this really cool, you know, Angular, React, you know, jQuery, Franken code and build this cool interface. But the back end is still the same. Those those traditional systems, transactional systems aren't going anywhere. So modernization is really kind of additive. And it also, it replaces previous generations of modernization, but it doesn't actually eradicate the, the back, you know, back end core transactional systems out there. Yeah. And one of the things we found is that um, folks that maybe had modernized by going to the cloud, but then realized how important the uh, data was that was back and the dependencies between the applications that were back on premise have actually, those folks have brought some of those applications back from the cloud for that because of those data dependencies, the older architectures aren't going away, that it's very important that there's, a, you know, um, a, a tight linkage between the new modern architectures and um, the existing. And so that is actually, you know, another reason why folks um, are very cognizant of not only how they modernize, but where they put those new modern apps. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Well, um, I noticed in the report that the you mentioned that the traditional architectures uh, were really starting to drop. And I think it, maybe it was like 12% that you saw. Um, for the, the part of our audience that is not, has not either not embraced automation at all, or um, or is not part of the teams that are that are making that shift. You know what what message would you have for them? Wow, make that shift. Um, it's yeah. a <laughs> or make that shift, or or upskill, or or whatever. Upskill, yeah, it is because it's really hard, right? Traditional architectures, and we define those as being like monoliths. Um, your client server, your three-tier web apps, right? The things that were written, you know, when Lori was allowed to code, which is <laughs> a while ago, um, right? So, and those were not built in a way that really facilitates automation, right? I mean, sure, we had make files that stretched across like 15 different apps, right? But that's really not automation. That's a build system, right? The automation is something we it was never considered. So it's really hard to, to bolt automation onto those, unless you're doing something like lift and shift, which is one of the reasons we see that. It's not about modernizing the app, it becomes about modernizing operations. So you lift and shift to the cloud or you put it in a container if you can, because then you get the benefit of automation around the operations and the management of the infrastructure and the systems that need to deliver and secure it. So that's kind of where we see that, you know, that happening for for a lot i think it was about 40 percent that were lifting and shifting to the cloud um but they weren't touching the app so they're trying to get the benefits of automation they know they need it um and that's the most you know i guess direct and easy route for them to get there and that i and that that i think is indicative of you know how covid really accelerated um that those those efforts right because that was something that you but potentially you could do in a, a pretty short, in a short time frame, depending on what your existing app architecture was. Yeah. Do you yeah. see the lift and shift as a, uh, like an incremental start to automation or it's uh, just a, I really just want my infrastructure taken care of, but maybe that's a, a legacy app that, that I'm not going to touch. It's going to go away eventually. And so I'm just going to park it somewhere else where I don't physically have to manage that, that architecture. Wow. Yes. I think that's one of the reasons. That's, that is one of the reasons, right? If you, well, if you have a, an effort, right, to modernize both your apps and, and your interfaces and your operations, that's a big effort. You don't have time to be babysitting, right, aging applications that you know are going to be out of service soon. So putting them in the cloud is a way to kind of get rid of them and have someone else babysit them while you're focused on the more important work of figuring out how to modernize everything and, and get it running. So I think there's some of that. 
Um, some of it is, yes, the start to you know, more automation, particularly in the cloud. Because once you put it in the cloud, now you have access to all of these tools and systems, right? And the ability to kind of start doing your automation there and getting familiar with it so that you can put that into bigger practice with other applications. Yeah. It's like it's like the gateway drug, right? The, <laughs> the first the first one's free, but yeah, after that. Hey, one of the one of the things that caught me is uh, one of the barriers, I think, and you guys correct me, on the automation, you know, as people move to automation was the lack of skills of people, you know, knowing how to automate, among other things. So maybe um, Cindy, maybe you could talk about that if you don't mind for a quick second. Like what's what's holding people back from fully automating? So, you know, I, as I as I look at digital transformation, I look at it as uh, we, well, we, we both look at it across people, process and, and, and infrastructure and systems. Right. And so one of the things is that the, the, the move to automation is deeply personal. Right. This is about people. It is about their org structure and it is about the new like the what they are now being asked to do for in their day to day job. And yeah. so it, it, so you, you you think about that and you, you think about someone who is used to, you know, maybe on the network side, their bonus is tied to the up uptime of the network. Right. right. And so you're going to be really hesitant to do something new because you don't, and, and, and you know, because you're, you know, your career, your livelihood is on the line. Um, but yet you have, you, your applications are now in multiple environments. Your, um, and, and the, uh, the networking, the security, everything is different across all those environments. So, to get back to your question, in particular around skill sets, what's really, um, what's really challenging is that in each environment there there brings new complexity and with new with new complexity with new systems to learn you have all these different new skill sets that you need to learn so i think yeah. it's up to um it's a, it's up to us at, at f5 to help our customers um find those tools and those skill sets that are going to enable them to work across the different systems that they have to yeah. Speaking about the complexity, you know, it's like one of the things I, I always try to, it's like when I start to feel pretty proud of myself and, and thinking, you know, I've arrived, I go out and look at things like the cloud native uh, uh, ecosystem. And there's this big giant chart of, of like all the different technologies within each little uh, segment of the industry. And it's like, it's so overwhelming. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm really, I'm really this small. And that's, that's a, that's a good thing, but you know, there's no shortage of, of things to learn out there. And so, you know, as we're talking about the challenges uh, that, that people, that organization are, are facing, you know, do you have, you know, like top two, three things that, that people should be focusing on rather than like the, the nuance of application a, so it's like, Oh, you need to learn Ansible or you need to learn Terraform or whatever. What, what generally, do people need to to start investing in? Wow. Um, so the data says that right number one thing that you need to invest in is people. Um, everyone says the biggest challenge is they just don't have they don't have the people. They lack right the skilled professionals to actually manage these projects and and get them done. So hmm. you need to invest in people. And right now that's really hard. Um, because everybody wants that same talent. So everybody's kind of fighting for it. So if you have that talent, you're in a good position because everybody wants you. But if you're looking for it, not so good because, you know, you have to fight everyone for it. But right behind that, we see things like integration of tool sets across vendors, right? Which makes sense. If you're trying to, you know, pull together three different vendors in the infrastructure, they're all going to have different APIs, different different models, different ways, and they're not pre-integrated. So they have to do it themselves. And right, when is the, when, when did they learn those skills, right? How to do that kind of integration. Um, and right behind that, um, to no one's surprise would be budget, right? Funded. If you want to, you know, forward these things, you have to fund them, not only in terms of tools, but in terms of talent and in 
in terms of training, right? Tools, talent, training. You have to fund all three or you're not going to be able to move that project closer, right, to to an end state that you're happy with. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And and it's like a, an answer that I wasn't expecting, but is is dead on. You know, I was thinking I was thinking more on the technology side, but you're right. You gotta invest in people and you got you gotta have budget to do that. And so yeah. well done, Lori. I just I just looked at the data. That's what the data said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the data's right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> And I think one of the things we have seen over the years in um, this survey that we've done is that um, organizations are starting, they're moving towards standardization in terms of the tools that they're using, right? Like, so a few years back, and I don't quite remember the numbers, but a few years back, folks were using on average, say like two or three different um, tools for automation. And now Lori, what I think the number, um, we're, we're below two now, right? For the, num the number of tools folks are using. 1.6. I, I if four, year, four or five years ago, we were at four because that surprised yeah. me. And I remember we had that, just we had a discussion, Cindy and I, and I said, this is gonna continue to go down. And we watched it and then it started to go down and now it's down below two because right, all things in the enterprise tend towards standardization. So we're seeing that happen. And that's actually kind of one of the defense mechanisms of every enterprise to deal with the, we don't have the talent, we don't have the, the training, all these things are confusing is to gravitate toward, we have one tool that everybody learns and we invest in that. And, and we don't, you know, we don't worry about the other ones because we have to. Um, and it's usually an industry standard because then you can hire talent that already has experience. And that way you kind of, Right, build the build the base as it were. <laughs> yeah. And tools tool sprawl is a problem whether you're on the technical side or or are doing, you know, finance. It's like more tools, less productivity. <laughs> right. um, so right. it is it is good to see. And and again, it doesn't really matter what that tool is, just find a tool that works, covers your use cases, and then standardize on it. And then yeah. I've also noticed that some companies, like some leading companies, will actually put on their career pages what tools they use because as a way to attract talent, right. To, to, mm -hmm. you know, to bring out that, you know, we're doing innovative things come yeah. here. These are, this is what we've standardized on, you know, come join us. Yeah. yeah. It's, but it's, but it's, if you are a hiring manager, you know, maybe you ought to know a, enough about the tool to know that if the tool's like less than two years old, you, you probably can't require seven to 10 years of experience. <laughs> in that tool. So. You think. <laughs> No, Jason, shut your mouth. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, hey, you know, in interestingly on the tool thing, as I was thinking about this, you know, the average a few years ago was four. Now it's 1.6. It's kind of like the average family. They have two and a half kids. It's like, how do you do that? I get it with averages. Um, anyway, but the but it's also interesting as we've talking as we've talked to some people about automation and automation tools that not every automation tool does the full job, you know? I mean, it does what it's supposed to do, but it doesn't do everything. So it seems to me that that there is a bit of a balance that it's like, I'm going to need a few tools in my automation tool belt. Um, so I can't ever go down to like one, you know, or kind of thing. I don't know if y'all have any thoughts around that kind of, kind of that balance. I, I do, because I think that's why, um, that's why a declarative model has been right pushed for so long and becoming so important in automation because yeah. one tool can drive change across an entire right disparate set of infrastructure and systems if they all support a declarative model because those models don't have to be specifically programmed right I don't have to I, I don't have to as a tool support your API and your particular model of how you build a network or build a VIP or, or build an app. I just have to know how to talk to you and say, hey, here's your configuration file, right, yeah. basically. And then I can push that out. So you can use one tool to do your orchestration across that or mm -hmm. your automation, however you want to refer to it. I'll be, I'll be generous with that. Um, <laughs> you can if you all support declarative, but we know not everybody is supporting that declarative model yet, right? So it's still kind of in between, which 
you know, we'll get there eventually, but that is the answer, I think, ultimately to, to how that gets resolved. Yeah. 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 I, I just, this is totally unrelated, but it popped into my head and I wanted to share it. Um, Independence Day, when that movie came out, what was that 1993, 1996, something like that? I don't know. It was a long time ago. And and just the absurdity of, of him flying up to the big giant mothership and giving it a virus. And it's like, maybe, maybe they just had figured out the interstellar declarative models so that, that it was a piece of cake for him to just like, I don't know, how to, I don't need to know how to blow up your ship and just, and disrupt the, the global, uh, you know, synchronization of your satellites. I, I just, you know, I just need to know that I need to do it. And I click the easy button. Okay. It's was, neither uh, here nor there. Yeah. It just popped into my head and it had to come out. That was that was uh, that was Randy Quaid, right? It was cousin Eddie. He can do anything, right. Jason. Yep. So, yeah, man. I, I think I think we've digressed just a touch. Just, just a Leslie, spin. thank you. Nineteen ninety six. There you go. Nineteen ninety six. Good to go. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Good to go. Well, hey. Well, maybe another another quick question, uh, not Independence Day related. Uh, deals with the edge, this whole idea of the edge. And that's kind of become the new, you know, hey, everybody's talking about the edge. So I don't know, Cindy, maybe you've got a thought on like, what is this edge everyone keeps talking about and what's driving us there? Oh, yeah. Edge, edge, is, edge is one of my favorite topics. Um, so a few things like, so if you think about the need for more, um, immersive customer experiences, right? Oh, go back to digital transformation. It's what's, what, why are people, what are the functions that are driving digital transformation? What we found out in the survey was it was really all about customer service, um, customer engagement, right? So from whether it was working with, you know, sales and marketing functions or fulfillment, it's all about how can I uh, make sure that I'm delighting my customers. And one of the ways that you delight your customers is you make sure that they can uh, get the vaccine appointment that they wanted to get. Yeah. And so the, um, not, I don't want to be controversial here, but in Massachusetts, yeah. it's been a complete disaster. And so, <laughs> um, so the, uh, uh, so the, the application performance is really important. So number one, what we find is the reason why folks are, um, looking into, um, you know, what they can do to the edge is to make sure that, you know, they have the the, right, the uh, appropriate performance for their application. The other reason that's really high on the list is um, really about data and collection of that data, right? So it, so it may not be that the processing of that data is happening at the edge, but you need to have that collection of the data so then you can go back and centralize it and analyze hmm. it. But th those are the top two reasons that we see. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, people want their stuff to work, right? It's um, whether it's a vaccine appointment or if Lori <laughs> wants to order, you know, some, uh, some food at home today. Right. 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 I yeah. Just I this time last year, filing for unemployment benefits, you know, when COVID. Oh, right. Yeah. That's too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Fascinating. Right. And, you know, there's, a, we are, Lori and I actually have a really interesting story about that, which is that in Massachusetts, what um, are when people were filing for unemployment, that actually went well because Massachusetts has put that system in the cloud. So that was able to scale very mm. quickly. Okay. And, um, and, and so, and I'll let Lori talk about Wisconsin because uh, yeah. <laughs> we are the fail uh, because our systems were, they weren't, they were never updated. So they are all running like really legacy, right? And trying to do that on the web. And it didn't scale. And of course, if you want to scale with people, well, that takes time because you have to train them. And that didn't work. So we've had just a terrible time dealing with unemployment claims in Wisconsin. I think they're still behind. They're still trying to, I mean, they're just, it's just really bad because they didn't modernize anything, nothing. Yeah. So hopefully this is kind of, you know, the wake up call and they, they say, well, we need to do that now. Yeah, we have we have the same scale problems with people and technology here in Illinois. In fact, but somebody was able to claim unemployment benefits on my behalf um, in in Illinois. So whoever you are, thank you very much. Still fighting that. And and the thing with Illinois is like you know I can't get in to say this is fraudulent, and I've 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 put that into the system. 
there's nobody I can call. Like, like it's legitimately nobody ever answers the phone. You will not get a live person. So it's like, please hang up on our automated system and, and, and going through every option. And right. so they'll say, you'll get a call back in three to five days. Never get a call back um, in all the times I've called them. But I have gotten the letter saying, hey, you were given some funds and you weren't authorized to have them. We need that money back. It's like, it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, wow. So thank you, Illinois. Wow. Love you. Good. Yeah. Wow. Well, and so the interesting thing, that I don't know if this would completely solve the problem, but um, <laughs> people are using the edge for compliance. Because um, particularly in um, in Europe, you know, there's very strong um, uh, uh, regulation around keeping data and personal information inside the inside a particular country, and so people are starting to use the edge to make sure that you can, you know, that that those controls are at the edge in a particular location, and that um, some of those regulations are being met by um, edge technology. Hmm. No. So hopefully, I guess what I'm trying to say, Jason, is hopefully someone out of state, it, maybe in the future, someone out of state couldn't claim your unemployment benefit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in the future. If, if I have any left at the end of all this. Yeah, we'll yeah. One can hope. A $50,000 bill back to, the, you know, back to me from the state of Illinois for the benefits I didn't consume. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, what a mess. Oh, a mess. Well, well hey, our good man. friend Peter Silva has a comment yeah. here. Yeah, and uh, it he actually was on my list for, for telemetry. And let me pop it up here. Uh, one thing I noticed was the need for telemetry, but they are not getting the insights they need, like the root cause of events. What are some of the limitations they're facing with telemetry? Well, most of the telemetry and the systems, they, they have the data. The data is all there. Um, the problem is really correlating it across systems and being able to recognize patterns that indicate problems. So right, the root cause may be, right, oh, I went, you know, used too much memory, it, you know, ran out of this or this, this kind of failure, but there's no recognition of it. Most of the dashboards that, that people see today are it's up, it's down, it's slow, it's fast, it's under this threshold. It's very binary. There's no nuances. There's not any... How does this impact another system, right? It's even very hard to see, you know, uh, this particular, uh, you know, the operating system here is having an issue with X. How does that affect the applications that might be hosted on it? Or the VM, yeah. the containers, the pod, or the API? Nobody knows. There's no correlation. Mm -hmm. So what's really missing here is like that layer of being able to look at all the data and go, look, here's a pattern. We're pretty sure it's this, right? And over time, learning that, yes, that is the problem. Um, so we're just going to tell you, hey, we think there's a problem in Y system. Um, you should go look at it before it becomes an incident that you need to explore. So it's really just the disconnect. The data is there. It's just not analyzed in a way that lets people really dig into and, and quickly find the answers that they're looking for, like root cause analysis for performance degradations for outages for an indication that an attack might be incoming. Those were the top three that they're just like, we don't, we, we don't get that. And we want it. Yeah. Well, and, and as a, you know, as a provider of a service, if you look at, you know, back in the day you had, you know, you had your client and your server and it was pretty easy to, to come to um, a, 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 an analysis of, of what happened uh, because you had very few, pieces to look at. Uh, but but the way things are now, uh, you go into containerization and, and you know, distributed within the data center, maybe some of the service calls are out to any number of clouds, and then they have their own uh, call outs and stuff, trying to piece all that together. You know, the data is there somewhere. Uh, but one, you may not even be collecting all of that data. And, and then, um, so, so yeah, the data exists. But uh, how you how you correlate it and can you correlate it becomes an issue. And remember, back in the day, you in order to help with that um, incident response, you would put one application on one server, and you would say, "Okay, I, so I know if there anything goes wrong with you know server A, that's the finance server." But now, and so in addition to, as you, as you said, Jason, now the application is distributed, the application itself and the business that it's supporting is distributed 
um, whether it's within the data center or between data centers. So that 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 and I would just would add from the telemetry standpoint, it's that it's the insights um, across the technology, but it's also the insights that then you can you can then communicate with the business to anticipate, okay, what will be wrong? Okay, let me tell my finance team that, you know, we are going to have a problem because their application that they need, you know, every end of quarter is having some issues. So, um, it, it, you know, they need that next layer. Yeah, yeah. you guys remember, oh, go ahead, Lori. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, it's also uniqueness of like, I mean, even the error codes that you get, right? What is error five? What? Four, three, A, B, X, Y. <laughs> Nobody knows what that means, right? I had I had a, a, a colleague who we were both IT architects, and he told me about I think ten years ago that there's still an exception in the code that I put in that has been useful. It was the Tweety Bird exception, not because it meant anything, but it's so unique that they can find immediately what's wrong. They know they're like Tweety Bird. That's that problem, right? It's <laughs> Right. So we don't we have so many error codes and so many different methods for how we report these things that it's really hard to distinguish between A and B. Right. No one you can't have Tweety Bird exceptions all over or they're meaningless. Right? <laughs> um, so hopefully analytics can solve that problem and, and, you know, be able to sort it out and give you the real information you need. Kind of like that. Right. Being able to identify it so positively that you don't have to you know dig through 50 logs and try and figure it out. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember when I worked, I used to work in a network operations center back in the the mid nineties and uh, we supported these point cast servers. I don't know if you remember point cast, but uh, the, you know, if, if it was alive, if you could ping the server, it was working. But if you couldn't ping the server, it was not working, but that, that was really the only diagnostic we had or needed because it, it was rock solid. If, if you could actually reach the box, but you know, our solution was always, you know, uh, did you turn it off and turn it on again? Uh, IT crowd, if you haven't seen it, it's awesome. Uh, but, but did you turn it off and turn it on again? So we'd have to do that. Back in the in the day, it was like a hands and feet action. You just like, okay, call the guy. They got to go, you know, reboot the server. When we got our first power strip that was like had an HTML, you know, interface or I mean, HTTP interface uh, that we could actually send a command to the power strip to knock one of the power box uh, trip it so that the server could reboot itself. It was like huge. It's like oh, big, big win for operations. But you know, you fast forward now to where it's like, man, you you might need to like fifteen to twenty pieces of information to know. Okay, the root cause of what else going on there. You get thousands of messages. This is the problem. And uh, one of the students on a robotics team I mentored, um, he's he's working for the DoD now uh, in an internship, and he's he's designing AI algorithms to take all that information in. And, and churn out, okay, I know we're getting flooded with thousands of events right now, but this is the problem, go here. And you know, mm -hmm. obviously they have to learn those cases because using machine learning to do that and all that. And then they are using the people to understand what the problem is. They train the machine to do that and look for that. And then, you know, so yeah, he's, he's having a good time with that. Cool. Yeah, that's, a, that's an, in, you, you make an interesting point. I mean, even in a simple system, Right. If the NIC fails, so that your hardware fails, you're also going to see an error in the in the network stack. Right. So in TCP, that says, "Oh, I can't communicate," and then up the stack, you're going to see, "Oh, I couldn't find the server." Right. You're going to see all these things that are like a cascading set of alerts that tell you something's wrong. But which one is actually the cause? Right. Is where AI comes in. So yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, pre-AI, at least for the network guys, there was a tool called uh, NetCool. Is either NetCool Omnibus or Omnibus oh, yeah. NetCool, and uh, and it did a lot of the deduplication of alarms and all that, and mm -hmm. and would allow you to say, hey, basically, you know, it was kind of like an if if you know if else chain, and it's like okay, best cause is kind of this, but it was very manual, not trainable, trainable, and you know, but maybe a precursor to you know what the all the AI uh, technologies are today. It's pretty neat. Mm. Awesome. Well, hey, right. Ryan, I know Peter Silva just popped one in there again. He he talked about the report, this whole report itself being about strategy. So he's like, hey, what are some strategies that organizations can glean from this, you know, that they need to start focusing on? So um, any thoughts on that? 
That's a Cindy question. She's the one yeah, who's the strategy org. So Cindy is the strategist. <laughs> <I love laughs> <it. laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you know, well, I, I think one of the things that we we ask folks is and because this report is really um about application services and the strategies you need around your applications. And um, so I think I, I think the top three things folks need to think about is they should be um, looking at how they can, you know, find the skills in their organization or at least up level their organization to meet the needs of moder both app modernization and orchestra and, and automation. And so what that means is you need to find ways to make these tools easier to use. And so whether, you know, you're investing with, um, you know, a supplier who helps in that ease of use, or you are standardizing on certain architectures so that helps your skill level. So that's, that's number one. And then I, I would say number two is, you know, we have found in this, in this report that, um, the, there is a new data driven distributed uh, data center basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, with that in mind, recognize that you need these skill sets and these tools to be um, ubiquitous across data centers, across multi-cloud. And so that includes the edge, it includes the cloud and it includes on-premises. So the, those, the, that's that's what I, I, would, I would come away from. Hmm. Cool, cool. Lori, you want to add? <laughs> Do it the same, but better. <laughs> I, I, think, I think Cindy hit on them. I think right one of the one of the strategies, especially around applications, and this may go you know fall into application services as well. Is really when you're modernizing, right? This is kind of giving us an, an opportunity, right? That soft that audit. The audit of what you have and what's duplicating, uh, perhaps processes or functions, is really important for kind of paring it down. Because how many people have found, right, 10 different applications doing the same thing? Either because you acquire companies or you just kept writing them because different business units don't talk to each other. Silos, imagine that. So really, hey, hey, Lori, that does not happen anymore. We don't have that? silos. I'm out of time. <laughs> just ignore it. Just keep running everything. It, if you can tear that down, right, and you can audit those those pieces and find out where the common, you know, common components are or the common functions are, and just really look through your portfolio of everything and really get a handle on what you have. Because if you're going to run a digital business, then you have digital assets and those digital assets need to be tracked better because they are now the foundation for everything you're doing. So you should know what you have, what you need and what you can get rid of. And I think that's an important strategy to, you know, for moving forward, especially as we come out of, you know, a, a COVID right driven world where, you know, you'll have more focus on your larger strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cindy, you had some slides. Is there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to go through in your slides? Um, well, Lori, I, mean, I just want to talk about. Here? Yeah, I think um, Lori, did we want to talk about the first one, and then maybe the last one? I think would be good to make sure we go over. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we touched on that on on the benefits of automation. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we asked a very simple yes no question: Do you treat infrastructure as code? Right. Do you do you do you have that practice? And 69% said yes, we do. I said all right, good. What does that mean for you in terms of all these different things? And one of them, right, is is, is that they deploy more frequently now because automation. So it has enabled them to actually right, get that speed of deployment and to do it more frequently um, as a practice. So automation, right, very important, very you know helpful in moving organizations forward. Yeah. yeah. And, and not just from a standpoint of de delivering new features, you know, as we released yesterday, you know, from a security standpoint too, being more agile in your, your development, or I mean, your deployments uh, allows you to stay on top of, you know, uh, vulnerabilities that, that, you know, they do happen and they will happen. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be prepared to, to be agile in that regard. Yep. 
Good to go. Yeah. I think we talked about this that, well, we talked about the 1.6 number right. of tools, yeah. but if you want what tools, right? What, when we said tools, what did you, what did we mean? So we, we kind of grouped them together this year because the list was getting really, really long. It was huge, right? You know how many tools are out there? So yes. we just said, you know, tools that, yeah, Jason's like, I use them all. <laughs> That's the number one, right? They're using some kind of tool no. and you have to, right? To, to direct the orchestration, to do the automation. But API management is used a lot. The public pro provider, right? Options, so their tools and their APIs are also used. Custom scripts, um, still used. Yep. That, that makes sense. Self-service portals and, and right vendor options. But you see, that's that's like the last thing. Everything is moving toward this. We want this overarching tool and everybody else needs to fit into that model. So um, I think we'll see that increase in that 1.6 number drop until it's just one. Right. I hope. I hope. <laughs> we talked about this. Um, you know, organizations, invest in your people. That's right. And then this last one, Cindy, you wanted to you wanted to uh, dive into a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then um, so, as I mentioned, you know, what I think I think ease of use is just so critical. We talk, and we talked about multi cloud. Um, and then, you know, if if one of the you know, if, if you're in multi cloud, what are your ch challenges, the skills, the tool sets and the budget? And then I don't know if you have the last slide. Um, is there one? Is there one more, Jason? Yep. Is that it? Oh, yeah, that there one. Yeah, that's one. So this, this I thought was really, um, was really interesting in terms of, you know, we talk about application strategies, like what are your application strategies? And, and to them, why, you know, what we ask the folks, what is most important from a business outcome standpoint for, from your app services? And number one was protecting customer data, right? Because if you think about the large breaches that we've, we've that we've seen, um, you know, it's really core to um, it's it's core to the brand. Um, it's core to the leadership of the company, and so that is the number one um, imperative for folks um, and protecting against business fraud, meeting uh, compliance. What I found was, what, but what I did think was kind of interesting was that the last one was employee productivity. So now we know why the skill sets are lagging because folks aren't focusing on employee productivity right. and the skills they need. But um, the good news is, is that you know, from a consumer standpoint, the customer is number one. So that's good. Yeah, that is that's fascinating. You know what I think about this? I don't mean to be. I don't mean to kind of point this more pessimistic or whatever. But from a customer perspective. <clears throat> I, sometimes I feel like there's so many breaches out there and I've got, you know, I'm a customer at, you know, place X, Y, and Z and chances are one of them has been breached. Right. And so chances are really good. My stuff is out there already. You know what I mean? Um, and so do you think that the, do you think there will ever be kind of a mindset from the customer consumer side of the house that it's like, you know, I don't want to say people won't care if their data gets breached, but I don't know. Are we building some kind of crazy, you know, just this immunity to it? Or do you think that's still going to be like top of mind for people no matter what? I, think, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead, Lori, and then I'll go. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm pretty sure. I'm, well, Jason has been like personal, maybe personally right. impacted by this. Right. Right? How did they get your information, right? They must have gotten it someplace else. So, right. I mean, for me, yes, I, I get email from you've been pwned at least right once a quarter. Right. Right? Yeah. It's out there. Every it just it's all out there, right? And I'm kind of I look at it and I go, eh, right, right. another one. Um, you know, but I think for but I know how to manage it, right? I know how to change my passwords. I know how to be very restrictive and careful about where my payment, uh, where where my payment information is stored, things like that, right? I'm very yeah. Very picky and very careful about how I do that. Most people aren't. So I think they're a little bit more nervous when they get an email like that and will be yeah. until they learn how to deal with it. Um, yeah. Because I don't think it's going away. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. Jason, did you have a thought of having been identity <laughs> breached a little bit, you know? 
Um, well, I was, yeah, I've, I've already forgotten what I was originally going to say, but when you say I was impacted, I, I think probably, you know, our healthcare provider that got impacted a couple of years ago, that's probably where they got the specific information they needed for uh, my unemployment stuff. So, yeah. So, you know, whether it's uh, vulnerabilities everywhere, breaches everywhere, it's, it's reality. It's, it's going to happen. So, you know, doing your best to protect against that is your, your only way forward, I think. Yeah. And yeah, and and to be fair, I don't mean that companies should not focus on protecting <laughs> I know. Where were you going with that, John? <laughs> I wasn't trying to say just, you know, abandon ship and, uh, you know, turn left or want to pivot. Um, I just think it's kind of interesting to think about from the consumer side, how desensitized are we? But yeah, Cindy, yeah. did you have a thought? I didn't want to leave you out of that one. No, I, I think I actually, the consumers may have gotten maybe desensitized, but I think that the companies will still need to prioritize that. And I think that um, particularly as we see regulation or as we see consequences at the C-suite of folks that will lose their job because of it, yeah. um, I, I think there's, it's a board level priority. I think we'll continue to see a focus on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think organizationally, it absolutely has to be a priority. Yeah. Um, John, to your point on the consumer, I remember what I was going to say. I'm thinking, you know, if consumers were really that concerned, they'd stop filling out all those stupid Facebook, you know, quizzes and, and things to where they're giving away every single security question asked everywhere to giving away all that data and filling out all those stupid little quizzes. Yeah. So. yeah. But, the, but Jason, the Facebook quizzes are so fun. <laughs> and I want to hear everyone's answers, you know. I don't I don't care what kind of cat in in, in Malaysia that you are going to be, you know. <laughs> I just don't care about that. But I, but I want to know what celebrity I look like, Jason. So I'm going to give you my social security number. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh man. Good to go. Well, we are up against time. Uh City and Lori, this has been awesome. Any parting thoughts? Mm -hmm. Uh, for the community on one, why they should go out and read this report, but but also just in, in general towards application strategy. Well, I'll start and I'll just say thank you for filling out the survey for the audience that has filled out the survey. We so appreciate it. This was our seventh year and it was fantastic to get the response we did from the community. And, um, you know, please reach out to us. We're on Twitter. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. We're super excited about this report and we're excited about next year's too. Yeah, awesome. And I think it's just, it's got a lot of good, right? It's it's a, it, it's, it's a peer, right? Check. You can go in and see, right? What are your peers, right? Really, what are they thinking about? What are they concerned about? How are they reacting? You know, what's going on in the industry? And that really helps, right? you know, inform your own strategy because ultimately, you know, you have to do what's best for your business and it's not going to be anything we told you to do necessarily. Um, <laughs> that's not, that's, that's just the way it is. So it, I think it gives you a lot of good information and data points to help you build your cases to get training, um, to, you know, to implement automation, to cut back the tools that you're using. Um, so yeah. go grab it and, and use it. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and for being here to share with the community. You guys have a great day. You too. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bye guys. Bye. Awesome. That was awesome. Yeah, that was fantastic, man. Lori and Cindy doing the hard work every, every year they do this. It's uh it's just a fascinating report. So yeah, for those that have never read any of those reports or certainly this year's, um, it's just, it's, it really is fascinating to think about the trends and what other companies are doing and, you know, the way things are moving and, uh, just, you know, the world, the world around us in technology moves so quickly, you know, in so many ways. And so to know like, Hey, here's a, here's a good snapshot of where we are today. And then here's, you know, the trend from last year and just to see, see where things move and shape and all that. It's super interesting. Yep. For sure. So, for sure. well, John, you're back here next week. For security security sidebar. Sidebar, right? That's right. That's right. All things security. And then and then uh, and then we're gonna not trust anyone, Jason, on March 25th. That's right. <laughs> there will be it's very important. Yes. There will be zero levels of trust on that show. 
That's right. Yep. That, we'll just go watch a bunch of X Files. We'll we'll build up that level of of trust. No one in preparation for our zero trust. Uh, that's right. Show. That's right. Well, you uh, you were you were very uh, good today to bring up a, a cousin Eddie Independence Day. You know, all in one reference. Put that so, in the wayback machine. Twenty five years ago, man. I I just I can't believe that. I yeah. can't believe it's been that long. Yeah, I totally remember the seeing that movie. Like when it was new. It's like the new thing in the theater. That's so right. good stuff. Yeah. All awesome. right. It's been well, a great show, Jason. Yeah, and we'll see uh, community. I'll see you in two weeks, John. You'll be back next week. Be back next. Have week. a great one. Civic. All right. And uh, hey, time. and yep. if you like content like this, please click subscribe. You'll get this. You'll get light boards. Uh, you'll get content that comes from Ask F Five on great solutions. Uh, so don't want to miss it. Click subscribe. We'll see you out there in the community.